Hello and welcome to the show. I'm your host Jason Knight and on this week's episode, if you don't lead you follow, we talk engineering. What's the best way for product and engineering to work together? How does a history and education help you create psychological safety for your teams? What is leadership and why should we all be taught it at school? Is mob programming a euphemism for binge watching The Sopranos or the best way to build great software? For answers to all these questions and more, please join us on One Night in Product. So, my guest tonight is Mac Maestrelli, engineering manager for Blockit, multilinguist, avid podcast fan, so I'll apologise in advance for this one, and as per his LinkedIn, a leader in capital letters, currently living in the capital of Sweden. Hi, Mac, how are you doing tonight? (laughs) Thank you, Jason. I'm doing fine. A bit rainy over here, but glad to be with you. Well, it can't rain all the time. The Crow, goth film for the ages. So, first of all, I will confess, I don't know a great deal about Blockit. And I went to the website, hoping to find out a little bit and a few things that I could throw at you, but it was almost entirely in Swedish. Google Translate tells me secondhand trade, job market, housing market, vehicles, motors, and jobs. What does Blockit actually do? It's pretty spot on. Uh, I think the interesting bit to know is the, is the backstory, right? Because Blockit belongs to a group, a Norwegian group called Shipstead which originally is a media group. And uh, we own a lot of newspaper in, the, in Norway and some in Sweden. And initially, Blockit was just, you know, the classified business <laughs> of newspaper moving online. But then uh, they, they realized it was a, a, a goose <laughs> that lay golden eggs. So we <laughs> essentially launch marketplace uh, of secondhand stuff, exactly like Google Translate uh, shows. Around the world, we grow to 36 countries uh, in, in which we were dominant. And then uh, last year, we split into two companies, uh, Shifted and Adevinta, of which we retain control. And last month, actually, Adevinta announced that uh, we bought eBay Global for the pocket money of $9 billion, <laughs> million <laughs> US dollars. Well, so, that's, that's, your, that's your bonus gone for the year then. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> unluckily, like I'm in the Shifted part, not in Adevinta one, but, <laughs> but it's, it's quite a, a behemut, I think is the English word. But, you know, you ask uh, what kind of problems uh, Blockit solve. And I, I would say, because marketplaces, you know, there are a dozen a cent. We are a qualitative marketplace. So we are generalist. Uh, so anything in principle can be traded if it's legal on our platform. But we have an emphasis on quality. So each ad, for example, is reviewed individually by a human. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, we cooperate with police and and we have a security unit. So we also take security of transaction and, you know, protection from scan very seriously. And, and therefore, we try to provide all accessory service like payment, uh, escrow account, home delivery, so to make a nice experience for the user. So that sounds like the sort of thing, this whole sort of manual curation, that, that sounds like the sort of thing that lots of companies are trying to kind of solve with AI these days and, and machine learning and, and, and try to automate as much of that stuff as possible. Is that something that, that you're getting into there or are you very much standing on the, the human curation part of that? Yeah, I, I think we obviously AI is taking the industry by storm, but uh, so far we have a, a super good unit of, at chips that level. For AI, it really like is considered one of the best in the countries. If you ask them, they would say we are the best. <laughs> but, of course, right? but anyway, <laughs> uh, but so far the effort is uh, is more on you know classifier, suggester, uh, so kind of uh, not on the I would say on the gate that uh, that uh, implies security or or protect the user. It's just more to make the experience on the platform a little bit uh, easier and more more fulfilling the needs. And I, I'm really proud of, uh, I mean, in general, Blockit is a, is a good place to, <laughs> to work, but I'm really proud that uh, we have, uh, together with AI, we also launch a big initiative on AI ethics. So we, we continuously like uh, discuss uh, issues about, you know, racism in algorithm and uh, involuntary discrimination. So we are on the ball, I would say. Well, that's really interesting and something that, that, that my company is involved a lot in kind of AI and algorithmic analysis of text and stuff like that. It's a fascinating area and there's obviously some really interesting things coming out. So it's, uh, it's, good, it's good to hear that, you, that, that you're, in, you're in the market. And what is it that you do at Blockit to, to help them solve 
the problems that block it solves. Yeah, I mean, my my role. I'm a, I'm an engineer manager, uh, so I'm, I'm in charge of engineers. Uh, but I'm not a programmer myself. I mean, uh, as a background, yes, but I don't code nowadays. And uh, the division we are essentially organizing two division. One is we call it core, and and has to to do with the block it, that everybody in Sweden know. In, in, in Swedish, you would say exactly like in English, you would say Google it. We say block it, it in Swedish to say sell it second hand, right? So that's surely just surely just block it. You don't yeah, exactly. need to say block yeah. it. You don't block it. It just, yeah, just block it. <laughs> something like this exactly. So that that is the core division that uh, improved the product, and my division is called adjacent and new. Uh, so I'm not uh, the most uh, knowledgeable guy in products, but we refer to a kind of classification in which we say if something is the same cohort of users but a different product, or as the same product to a different cohort of users, that we would classify as adjacent. And if it's a new product to new user, is new. And so I'm in charge of that division. We have five teams in it. And uh, so it's kind of intrapreneurship, I believe, is the word. So like uh, entrepreneurship, but within the company. And uh, my, my role as an engineering manager, beside taking good care of my engineers, is to really coach that division on agility and, and being lean and yeah, that's essentially my job, and I co-lead it with a, a product person uh, there. So it's a very hand-in-hand kind of process. Okay, so it's kind of a like a tag team of uh, of the two of you taking taking responsibility. So how you say you've you've got like five teams there? I think uh, how how I mean how many engineers you're looking at in, in total across the across those teams? Yeah, we have been a, a, kind of a frozen in time with Corona because, uh, of course, you know our business has been affected like uh, like others. So at the regime, it should be twenty two, but so far is a uh, six. <laughs> so, so there is room to grow still. <laughs> so one of the things that you said on your profile is that you consider yourself an, an innovator mm-hmm. with a knack for distilling complex problems into clear options and strategies. Now, obviously, that sounds a lot like product management. So like, looking, at, looking at the problem to solve and, and working out how best to solve it and, and giving the best solution to, to, to the users. But you also say, of course, that you've got a product person kind of co-running things with you. So how much of that is a, is a real partnership with, with that person also contributing to engineering or, and, and you contributing to product or, or do you very much stay in your own lanes? Yeah, I I don't know. Like I I would say is is a real co- cooperation in which we bring our respective expertise, right? But uh, I think one of the of the thing that we, me and Tobias, which is my partner, uh, find uh, uh, ourselves very aligned is that uh, there is not such a thing like product and tech. There is a product development, which <laughs> which implies using tech, and so is is really the process that we are both invested in. But uh, of course, he is a super competent product developer and knows theories and models and principles that I don't and vice versa. But that's, you know, the way we co-lead is not that we take, uh, it's not controlling <laughs> each other, is uh, is adding to each other reflection, right? And uh, And both of us, I would say, we use our respective domain knowledge, not really to feed instructions to <laughs> people reporting to us, but to make questions to them. I would say is is totally a cooperation where differences are not squashed ideologically; they are still there. Yeah, and there's this whole concept that to be a good product manager, you 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 don't need to have all the answers. You need to have all the questions and ask the right questions to get into the kind of the meat of what someone actually needs. So, and you know, asking them about their problem and trying to really understand their use cases. So, I think that that's that, that's, that's a really good kind of point. Yeah, you you, you don't want to just sit there and just pretend that you know everything it's got to be a collaboration so but, but on innovation i mean what's say maybe one innovation that that yeah, you know you you say you're an innovator so i presume that you've done some very th- some things that you consider very innovative is there like one thing that you would say was like a something that you're really proud of or the most yeah. proud of yeah I, I would say the way of working uh so first of all innovation is relative right so you go at google and whatever <laughs> is innovative for the mom and pop, you know, web firm <laughs> is uh, is probably you know entry level uh, stuff for Google. But where in relation to where we are, I think the thing I feel more proud is the way of working, uh, because uh, we 
we work with something called mob programming, which uh, in a nutshell is uh, when uh, the people who develop the product, which is not only engineers, <laughs> sit together at the same computer working on the same problem. And uh, this is not an invention of mine, but it's uh, me, Tobias, my team, but uh, it's our division who start using it and nail it down. So, and I can say this with, uh, you know, without uh, sounding like I'm blowing my own trumpet because it's really like the, the fruit of the, of the labor of my team, but they are so good at what they do as a way of working. And now we hold webinars and, and, you know, workshop for other division, in our company, other companies in the group, and even, you know, companies of our, for example, providers uh, and, and stuff. And it's uh, the, the thing that, that for me, you know, of course, we have metrics like, uh, you, know, you know, how many problems, uh, how, uh, how many hypotheses we validate, how many problems we solve. But the thing that really, you know, make my heart beat faster is that while mob programming typically is something the engineer come forward with and product people say, yeah, I don't know, because we don't really work this way. Now the growth lead, so the product person for the project are the one who say, do whatever to this unity, but don't <laughs> touch that because it's so awesome, right? You've been stratospheric results so that's a, an innovation for block it and something i feel very proud of yeah so and that's actually a really interesting point because of course when people think of innovation they probably think of like 3d interfaces for stuff and that is obviously in itself very innovative but it sounds like from your perspective and i know that you have an interest and a background in, in education as well that your kind of innovation for you is all about kind of as i've put it to people before like the product isn't just the product that you're making, but the product is the team that makes the product and the culture that, that enables you to make the product, which is definitely something that I'm you know keen to work on and, and, and keen to work with because I think it's so, so important to, to, to make sure that you're setting your teams up for success and not just sort of feeding them orders or, or, or just judging everything based on sort of vanity metrics. So it seems like you've, you've, you've put a lot of work into that. And also, I personally believe that not all prob products need to be innovative. Like if there is a product that uh, it just solved problems really well in a consolidated way, which is generally understood and, and works just fine, it's a viable product, right? Like if you can innovate, why not? But it's, I, I, I don't necessarily buy into the fact that you should innovate everything all the time. Sometimes it's about quality of delivering just what, what user respect. Sometimes you just need a doorstop, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> so you've got a strong background in youth education before you went into tech. And I know that you've, you've done a few initiatives, including working for the Council of Europe, which sounds very interesting and very wide ranging. So but before we get into that, how did you get into tech and product from that? So the, the short answer is the 2008 crisis. <laughs> so <laughs> I had uh, IT and computers and programming has been a passion of mine since I was a kid. Long story short, my neighbor, I didn't own, my family didn't own a, a computer, but my neighbor did. And I would, uh, he was an adult and I was, I would go behind him and to, in order to get access to the computer for five minutes and play Tetris five minutes. I had to watch him coding for hours. <laughs> <laughs> he was like a programmer instructor. So I learned to code by watching, not really by doing. <laughs> and, and then I carry it on all my life. And in 2008, long story short, I got married and I had a job in Australia where visa, a house and uh, everything was packaged together. And uh, I lost it during my honeymoon. My wife already left her job to move to, with me to Australia. And so what do people, what do companies buy even in time of crisis? IT services. And that's uh, how I started. What were some of the things that you were doing for the Council of Europe? Yeah, so at the Council of Europe, I had uh, uh, two roles, educational advisor and uh, campaign manager. So educational advisor is a profile for which you help groups that comes to the Council of Europe uh, to have seminars or educational activity. And you kind of help them maintaining a high standard of in terms of uh, educational level. And so I did that for a couple of years. And then we launched this international campaign called All Different, All Equal, that 46 country, like uh, 160 million people contacted. And uh, my role there was to coordinate the offices in all the countries in terms of uh, communication strategy and material that uh, was out. Wow. So it sounds like you probably helped to touch quite a lot of lives there and, and, and really sort of push 
education around 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 Europe, which um, I know also you have a lot of interest in just the, the general concept of education and and kind of some of the things that you've been talking around how education has helped you kind of build and nurture teams and mentor people and stuff like that. I mean, how how has how has that history as an educator helped you to build and nurture teams? Yeah, it, it, it's quite, um, I would say, a, a symbiotic relationship. Because I would say it's, it's actually tech as a hobby that helped me becoming a good educator, but it's a being a good educator that helped me become a good te- uh, engineering manager. So kind of a loop that feeds on itself. You know, education is often perceived or portrayed or romanticized as a kind of art, right? You, you have these people who is inspired about uh, and they, they have the kind of magic and so they can do stuff that others find difficult to do. It's not really like that, you know, and people in education know it's not that I'm breaking new ground here, like in, in stating <laughs> a new theory of education. But it, it's, it, it's, you know, there are theories, there are models, there are ways of doing it. And I think uh, being uh, so disciplined through coding and, and IT helped me, for example, to have this idea of going in passes and uh, progressive improvement or uh, improvements over stuff. So the idea that you could a bit test the debug. And so instead of, for example, plotting these uh, huge educational programs at once, you know, like the idea that you, at the time, I wouldn't know the word, but I would say really lean and agile way of developing stuff. Say like lean, lean education. <laughs> exactly. So that's... Which to be fair, if you think of education as a concept, it doesn't really seem to be the kind of thing that really the word lean is used with often. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> it's that, I would say. And the other thing that I, I in retrospect, I think uh, it helped me is that the uh, internet became, you know, kind of a service for the masses uh, uh, in the 90s where I was active in this environment. And this really helped me with uh, the idea of uh, just in time. So education normally is conceived like, uh, or was at least when I was a kid, more just in case. So you study stuff at school and they tell you, you'll see when you grow out, this will be super useful. And uh, <laughs> most, most often than not, that proved not to be true. But the internet really like uh, opened up this possibility that, uh, you know, you don't need to, to have a book at school or to have a library accessible. You can just fetch the information when you need it. And so... On the one end, you can get, uh, you, could, you could let go of stuff that uh, you don't need to memorize, right? Because you can look them up. On the other end, uh, you are able to explore your own question much more in depth. So this kind of uh, proactive, self-driven educational process, for me, comes from using the internet. And how, and how has that then impacted like, the way that you try to build your teams I mean, aside from obviously the typical stack overflow cliche, which that basically brings to mind, like, are there any kind of approaches that you've brought to team building that have directly arisen from from some of the work that you've done in education? Yeah. Or has that been something that you've developed since? No, it's, it's definitely there is a continuum there. In fact, when I joined IT, I, I, I immediately saw uh, management in IT like a an ideal way to combine the two. And I think at the very top, I would say the idea that you're there to serve your team rather than uh, them are, are, are there to serve you, it, it's key. Because as an educator, like uh, you are there to facilitate the learner education, not yours, right? So it, it's very much for me being a manager is kind of a learning partnership with my team where I, I try to serve their personal development. And uh, I think when you work in education, you're also used to meet people where they are and to to see them holistically maybe there's a cliche word but you 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 know you don't look at them like oh this is a i know a youth worker who comes for training you know oh this is a youth worker from this advantage area with this kind of experiences with this kind of ethical background with this kind of experience of um, of problem to solve and then you build the learning experience around that context and and in in tech is not obvious a lot of people tend to say oh this is a Backend Python developer, and that's your identity. <laughs> that's how deep it goes. <laughs> some sometimes, um, you know, I don't want to make a vignette out of this, but there is some truth there. And then, obviously, because as a manager, you help people develop, having an idea of how people learn and how to coach them obviously help. So, yeah, and I think that this whole idea of kind of cross-functional teams and, and sort of self-organizing development, it. it only works if people aren't in boxes as much as possible 
you know, so that they can pick up and lean into certain areas that maybe weren't what they originally thought that they were there to do. And like the, the, like you say, put saying that someone's a Python developer is fantastic if that's all you ever want them to do. But you kind of want people to at least, you know, they could be experts in Python, sure. They could be a, a pandas expert or, or whatever else it is that they need to be, but that they that, that shouldn't just be the, the start and end. There's There's got to be that kind of more, for want of a better word, holistic thinking around you know, problem solving. Because otherwise you're just creating too many handoffs as well, which is obviously slows us down. Yeah, absolutely. The the, the thing is also when you are in the in in that contest where you are pigeonhole somewhere and you want to go somewhere else, like it's a kind of conundrum. Uh, uh, the more you stay in the the box, the higher is your status as an expert. The more you try to get out, the, the more you know risk to make a, a, a fun of yourself. And so I work a lot with my team on this idea of trust as the feeling okay to be vulnerable in front of others, which come again from education, because education is by definition, you're learning something that you don't already know. So you're by definition in learning context, you are vulnerable. And, and, and this is so powerful. Like uh, I, I get a lot of feedback from my engineer on how powerful that is and how many positive dynamic unlocks in the team. Well, it's the, whole, it's the whole concept of like psychological safety, right? And and making sure that that, that people don't get like uh, the, the, this. There's the whole concept of sort of growth mindset versus fixed mindset, and how you should always be looking to expand and improve on yourself. And I guess people need to be a people need to be not afraid to to try things because I've certainly seen teams in the past where you know it felt like they were they were they were terrified of of doing anything other than what they were told that they should be doing, and I'm sure that made the management very happy, but it certainly didn't make them very happy. And it also ultimately doesn't lead to very good results. So one quote from you that, that you passed across before this call was, leadership is a key to building a better society. Yeah, I, I believe in, in that. Like we, in the warm up, we spoke about the thing I'm, I'm thinking to a podcast myself. And I really believe, and that could be the team, right? Leadership as a, as a contribution to society. I really think that uh, you know, if, if you don't lead, you follow, which is not bad by itself. But if it's the only thing that you can do, follow, <laughs> you're not really active as a citizen, as a, per, as, a, as a person in society. So I think uh, for me, leadership, being able to lead others is kind of uh, literacy, right? You should be able to count, to read, write and lead others. Yeah, I, I, I just think that through leading others, like there are so many I'm kind of value based person, but I, I really think like uh, you you learn to care for others. So you, it automatically contributes to a better society because uh, you you prick uh, you not prick is Swedish you pop <laughs> your <laughs> your <laughs> your bubble and you embrace uh, diversity and needs of the others and and you you acquire a wider view angle by default. So. Yeah, and I think that diversity as well is a, is a thing that's really important in any team, uh, diversity in all forms, because I think that, I mean, I don't know how it is in, in, in Sweden, but there's obviously the kind of tech cliche that kind of every, everyone looks the same and everyone has the same kind of background. And that obviously leads to people just you know thinking and doing the same things, aside from the societal impact of that as well, which is in itself a very big problem. But like, even if that weren't a problem, which by the way, it absolutely is, you still don't just want a bunch of people that look just like you yeah. trying to solve a problem. But you, you also, on top of that, you also don't want simply different people to be sit next to each other and ignore each other or, or you know, have a, a common code that uh, they, they, they follow and they don't allow them to express their diversity. And that, that's, we call it inclusion, right? And I think uh, leadership is exactly a catalyst for inclusion. It is one of these things in which... Uh, you know, sure, you can create an environment that fosters that kind of behavior. But if, as a leader, you're able to, you know, exemplify that uh, that behavior and, uh, you know, articulate your thought around that, because that that's another thing. Like you need to be able to reason in abstract terms when when you speak about, uh, you know, growth and, and 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 learning. So if you can do that, then you're a catalyst for, you know, the society of the future. If you ask me, and that's definitely where we should all be heading. You describe yourself as a passionate technologist. I wondered what are some or perhaps one 
technology that really excites you these days? Yeah, there are some technology that excite me I know very little about, to be honest, and some I know well. <laughs> but for example, one technology, my background is in natural sciences, so I, I studied my first share of biology and zoology and kind of like that. So one technology that excites me is CRISPR, which is, I think the pronunciation maybe is CRISPR, which is essentially like, a, a, yeah, it's many things, it's, a, it's a DNA, it's a protein, but essentially think of cut and paste for gene editing. And because Science fiction has, has uh, you know, inculcated this idea that, uh, you know, scientists, uh, you know, kind of writing a software and they program genes, but it is not like that. It's very much like rolling a bunch of dice and then going through them and find, oh, this one roll on the face I like, I pick it and then rinse and repeat. And this is really like cut and paste genetic code. So I, I think the potential for this to, you know, address like degenerative illness and uh, and also like in the field of you know immunology relevant today. Yeah, I wonder what they could use that for. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it is very exciting uh, for me that one. But obviously, I mean, again, we were just touching on diversity, and there's obviously, I guess, there's a kind of un- there's kind of a dark side to kind of gene editing as well, which is about genetic or kind of eugenics. Yeah, well, but yeah, basically eugenics and, and and basically kind of getting rid of certain traits entirely. And I guess that there's always a risk with all technologies, but this seems like such a fundamental thing. Like it, it's it's something that that does have implications if if it's not, I guess, controlled or or you know, there's legislation to to help it. But I guess I don't know. I don't even know what the question is. It's just like. Is that a concern for you? Obviously, like uh, every technology can be used in <laughs> good and bad. And this, sure, it goes to touch such a fundamental aspect of our identity, which, you know, not being concerned is just being silly. That said, I think that to use this technology for something evil, you need to be very deliberate and very open about it. I'm more concerned, you know, to, and I don't, will name no company, but there are a lot of companies who do uh, <laughs> genetic, uh, you know, profiling for you. And uh, they create an uh, enormous data bank. They uh, relate people with each other that don't even know they are related to each other. And that data, uh, when you, you know, when then you sell and commercialize it, can have a much more adverse effect. Because you, you could, you know, just realize through, you know, social platform that people prefer people who are blonde for just saying something, right? And then uh, you having access to that genetic code, you will, you know, propose matching with people that has that uh, the gene. So there are a lot of more subtle stuff that happen out of sight, which I think could be much more powerful than you know, the crazy scientists that say, hey, let's create, <laughs> you know, the <laughs> science fiction scenario. Well, you know, we'll see, I guess. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and have you got any advice for kind of aspiring leaders or aspiring team builders that you'd like to pass on based on your experience? Yeah, I think uh, <laughs> I would say get rid of the Hollywood Im- imagery about leaders, right? Because if you take a the standard Hollywood movie, uh, blockbuster, the leader is uh, super fit, super smart, super rich, uh, whatever is the idealized uh, kind of prototype of a perfect man that always know what is good to do. And uh, even in, in the, in the doubt uh, is a doubt between being a saint or a hero, right? Uh, something like this. And of course, this is daunting. If you say, oh, I would like to, to lead, to be uh, in any position of leadership, but I need to be always right, uh, inspiring to others. And so, so get rid of the stuff. That's not how you lead people. I think uh, you lead people by being sensible and vulnerable, right? And so I would recommend start by thinking of yourself, by re- reframing leadership as an act of service towards others. If you do that, automatically you will be you know, humble enough to listen to the people who talk to you and that you serve and to act on the feedback they give to you. And I think uh, th- that's really the key to that. Like, it's not about being perfect, but it's about showing that you really care and using your brain, of course. Yeah, something that I try to do every day, um, use my brain, that is. 
Obviously, this is notionally a, a, a product management podcast, so I wondered if you could maybe give me an insight into what your favorite product that you're currently using today is. Yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it's, uh, it's interesting. I recently installed, like a, all the Nordic countries have a unified postal uh, service. It's called PostNord. And uh, they suck, <laughs> in general. <laughs> but I installed the app for tracking packages. And I find it delightful because it's an app that does exactly what a user would want it to do. And it's full of small nuggets, right? Stupid stuff. Like uh, you have the opening hours of the pickup point or the telephone number just one click away. Or you can move a package which has been like misplaced between receiving or sending. You can, uh, you know, change manually the status if it goes out of sync. So it's full of stuff to say, I wonder if I can do that. And puff is there. And the user interface is clean. There is not cluttered. It's just, you know, one of those products that say more of this, like simple solve a need, not overblown, pleasure to use. I guess the follow-on question from that is, could you think of one product that just sucks? <laughs> Only one? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, can, you, can, you can have a couple if you, no, if you need. Again, I have, I have I, 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 I reason in, in, in cluster, right? So there are what I call formal fueled uh, product. Uh, you had an entire episode about bitcoins. That's definitely one, <laughs> you know. But I could, I could say the Yo app of some years ago. Uh, so stuff that uh, you know, any sane person look at this and say, what is the problem this solve? Uh, how you know, like it, there is really no rationale for it. That is, uh, it you know, it passed scrutiny from the beginning. So those are products that I that I hate because it it kind of. Uh, it kind of pollute the the entrepreneurial panorama. Like you know, I say, oh, I should do that stuff to get uh, you know funding for my ideas, <laughs> and it, it, and just bad. And then of course, toxic stuff. I, I really hate uh, hate like a uh, Facebook Uber are product that I deem toxic with a net uh, terrible effect on society. I'm I know that this probably will alienate seventy percent of your listener. You can cut this off, but I hate the way Apple. Uh, you know, baking obsolescence in their product. Like they are really pioneer in making stuff that should be fixable, uh, just a throwaway device. Um, and then, of course, a- any kind of crippleware kind of product that they uh, really by design thought not to function to get you to put more money in it. And then they just say, I think it's violate a f- fundamental trust bond between user and producer services. Yeah, you hear about certain software where it actually has the functionality inside it. It's just turned off. So you've already got it. You've bought it. Also, I guess actually another thing that springs to mind, and I can't even remember which book it was now, but there was a book that got deleted from everyone's Kindles because they bought it and and then the, there was some kind of, I guess, licensing issue or something like that, and then basically it just disappeared from, everyone, from everyone's Kindles. So thanks for that, Amazon. <laughs> That's an entire <laughs> field that I probably you don't want to open at uh, at this time in, in the night but uh, i'm a kind of a free software movement geek and all this stuff about owning and and retaining control of what you have all reason to consider yours <laughs> it's it's key for my vision of the world so i can't have richard stallman but i can have you <laughs> that's the most important thing <laughs> So uh, where where can people reach you if they want to continue the conversation after this podcast? Yes, I'm uh, social media shy, but uh, I'm on LinkedIn <laughs> and I, I guess you will put my my uh, you know link in the show notes. Uh, yeah, why not? So uh, that's probably the best way to reach me. Excellent. And and last of all if you could give a an inspirational quote of your choice. Oi. <laughs> <laughs> that was not a you question. You can choose you it in any, any, of, <laughs> any, any of the five languages that you can speak. Mm. I will go with something. I will go with something cheesy, uh, maybe, but uh, that I, I think is true. Uh, I don't know who said it, but uh, it, it goes like this. I believe a team is not a group of people working together; it's a group of people trusting each other. Well, if we find out that no one actually said that, then you can claim it. <laughs> this is this is the official copyright notice. <laughs> well, thanks, Mac, for the chat. It's been really interesting to, to dig inside your head. And I hope we can stay in touch. Uh, and, uh, yeah, have a great evening. 
Thank you, Jason. It was a pleasure to be on. As ever, thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed the show today, I'd love it if you left a review, shared it with your friends, subscribed, or followed the show on Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn. 